Thank you, Mark. Oh, it's good. Good morning. Boker Tov. Uh, this is Hebrew for good morning. Well, it is a good morning, and it is good to be with you. And, uh, uh, you know, I, we, we need to begin again today uh, just reminding ourselves as we continue our way through the crisis in the Middle East uh, that Jesus told us, let your heart not be troubled. Uh, he, he said, you believe in God, believe also in me. And he reminded us that, he's, that he had to, to go away. He had to leave so that he could prepare a place for us, so he could come back and get us and take us to that place. And, and Jesus is coming back. And uh, the reason it's taken so long, apparently, is that he's sort of doing a, a, the, the uh, divine, ultimate uh, version of uh, uh, extreme home makeover, home edition. You know, and there's going to be a point where we finally, you know, the you know, Lord's going to say, you know, angels, move that bus, and we're going to oh my gosh, this is it. And it's, take, it's just taking a little while to prepare it to be just so perfect. So I'm looking forward to that day. And we need to remind ourselves of that, uh, I think, every day, that Jesus loves us, that he's coming back for us, that he's preparing a place for us, that he hasn't forgotten about us, that he's not, you know, it's not, he, he cares for us deeply, that he has a plan and purpose for our lives. So when we see evil rising, uh, it keeps it in context. Now, this topic of this particular session now is called Inside the Revolution. Uh, and, and the organizers of the conference asked me to speak, uh, drawing it off the topic of the title of my um, Re, uh, recent nonfiction book, Inside the Revolution, uh, why the followers of Jihad, Jefferson, and Jesus are battling to dominate the Middle East and transform the world. Uh, it, it came out last year as a hard uh, cover uh, nonfiction book. We released a documentary film by the same title based on the book on September 11th of last year, and, and now a study guide is out as well. So as we go through these things, if you haven't uh, gone through it yourself or you uh, haven't gone through it with your small group Bible study or your home fellowship group, I would encourage you to consider, uh, you know, uh, valuing yourself of those resources. Watch the film uh, as a family, as a, as a small group, uh, and then start working your way through the book and through the study guide as a way to understand three extraordinarily important dynamics that are going on in the Middle East today. And it helps you understand uh, the Middle East crisis. So I want to I wanna give you a flavor of those three. I want you to help you understand uh, a, a, an executive summary of each of those three uh, dynamics, those, those three revolutionary movements this morning. The revolution in Iran, the Ayatollah Khomeini led in 1979, of course, deposed uh, the pro-Western, pro-U.S., pro-Israel Shah of Iran and uh, instituted the world's first Islamic republic in, in a Shia country uh, in which an Islamic jihadist movement took over uh, an ally of the United States and, and turned it into one of our uh, most concerning enemies. The question uh, last year, at the 30th anniversary of that revolution, uh, the people were asking was, where is the revolution now? And I had been spending a good, you know, 10, 12 years of my life uh, studying the Islamic revolution f for its own sake, to understand it, but to also understand its impact on the United States, on Israel. I had had the opportunity to travel extensively throughout uh, the Middle East and, and interview hundreds of different uh, leaders at all kinds of different levels. And so I decided to write a book that would come out last year. Uh, it came out uh, right at the time uh, of the 30th anniversary of the Iranian Islamic Revolution because my, my sense of it was that there wasn't just one revolution ongoing, this Islamic Revolution. There's actually three revolutions going on. Uh, one I describe as the radicals, the second is the reformers, and the third are the revivalists. Now, I want to make it clear uh, as, we, as I start to kind of go over that, that uh, most Muslims of the 1.3, 1.4 billion Muslims in the world are not revolutionaries of any one of those three categories. Most, the vast, vast majority of Muslims are what I would call the rank and file, meaning they're not trying to change the world. They're trying to, you know, 
get their kids to school on time and get their kids an education and, 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 and have a decent job and, and, and care for their families and, and, and be faithful to their understanding of God through Allah, through Muhammad, because that's their worldview at this stage of life. So they're not trying to change the world. Uh, the, the, so the vast majority, it's, you have to be, understand, are rank and file. Uh, everyday, ordinary citizens throughout the, uh, throughout the world, um, mostly obviously in the Middle East. Uh, the biggest Muslim country by population, of course, is in Asia, Indonesia. And of course, there are several million uh, Muslims here in the United States and, in, and as many in Canada as well and so forth. So it, it's important to know that, that the revolution is not something that most Muslims are trying to be part of, though they're watching carefully. Okay, these revolutions are, uh, are, are certainly on the minds and hearts of people watching the, the dynamic in their society. Now, okay, so that's, that's the, the context. Now, you have to understand that for 1400 years, Islam has been a force on the earth, right? And as Dr. Lutzer uh, brilliantly walked us through, uh, you, you see a lot of the, uh, the, the roots of the, the origins of this crisis. Uh, between Islam and Jews and Christians. And as Dr. Lutzer noted, there was a, a phase of Muhammad's life, or from his perspective, ministry, in which he was trying to persuade Jews and Christians that, uh, that they were good, they were part of the people of the book, that's how the Quran describes them, uh, Jews and Christians, and that Islam was the, simply the successor, the completion of that movement. First came the Jews, they had a revelation from God, then came Jesus and, and, and the whole Christian movement, and that was sort of the next stage, and then Islam came to finalize everything, though change everything, but he didn't say it that way. Um, and, and so there was a phase in which he was trying to persuade Jews and Christians in the Arabian Peninsula uh, that he was the prophet of God uh, come to complete everything. Uh, Jews and Christians, for the most part, didn't buy it. And this so infuriated Muhammad that eventually he turned against them violently. And this is where you get the verses then in the Quran that talk about violent jihad, uh, about, uh, about destroying Judaism and Christianity. Now, for centuries and centuries and centuries, Islam was dominant. Islam's armies were victorious. And, uh, and this gave the Muslims a a strong and powerful sense of identity because there's a strong uh, uh, sense within Islam that, that military victory is evidence of God's favor. Okay? They're not the only culture in history that has believed that you know, if you win, that means God's with you. And so when they were winning and winning and winning and winning and winning and destroying uh, and conquering, and their, their, their reach was going from a tiny enclave on the uh, southwest you know, shores of uh, the Arabian Peninsula along the Red Sea to as far out to Mecca in the west and Indonesia in the east, there was a clear, strong, deep-rooted sense that Allah is with us. See, this is proof because we're winning, we're conquering. Obviously, there were ups and downs within that, but that was the vast, uh, predominant truth that, that, uh, that uh, Islam was winning uh, for many, many centuries. However, uh, the last hundred years or so haven't gone well for Islam. And uh, you could predate it a little bit, but generally speaking, you would see things begin to unravel when the Western powers uh, defeated the Ottoman Empire uh, in the early 1920s, uh, as World War I was coming to a conclusion. And this is, when, uh, this is what uh, Dr. Lutzer referred to, that Osama bin Laden in his, in, in his manifestos and his sermons uh, often has referred to uh, the, the, the trauma that was imposed upon uh, the Muslim world 80 years ago. Now that means many things. It means something special uh, and infuriating to a Muslim, but not so much to us who try to remember our World War I history and are like, uh, Archduke, something, Serbia, I, war to end all war. Okay, uh, let's just move on to something else we know. Um, 
So we struggle with the significance of this, but it was hugely significant because for something of you know four centuries or so, uh, the Ottoman Empire was the dominant empire on the planet, uh, you know, and it was sort of headquartered in Constantinople, what we now call Istanbul. I won't sing the song. So, but when they lost uh, the, the Ottoman Empire, when the Caliphate, this Islamic Empire, uh, fell, uh, and the Western powers took over, and then the head of Turkey, the new head of Turkey, Kemal Mustafa Ataturk, decided, you know what, we're not, we're, we'll, we'll be Muslims, but we're going to be uh, uh, pro-Western Muslims. We're going to dress in suits, and we're going to switch our alphabet to a Western alphabet, and we're going to um, engage with the West, and eventually they become a NATO ally. And you think, wow, th this is, uh, um, this, the heart of Islam is moving towards us. Well, this infuriated many Muslims. And the long story short of it, uh, beginning in the early 1900s, certainly the 1920s, and working forward to 1979, Islam began to experience a series of catastrophic failures. Uh, most Muslim countries teamed with uh, the, Nazi, the Nazi regime, uh, including the, the Mufti of Jerusalem uh, during World War II. That didn't go well for them. Uh, and then, not only were they losing to the Christian powers, and I put that in quotes because, you know, the Western powers weren't always doing things uh, in the name of Jesus, or, uh, and sometimes they, you know, as Dr. Luther noted rightly, uh, we shouldn't be doing things uh, militarily in the name of Jesus. But, I, but, but from the perspective of Muslims, they were losing to the Christian powers. That was bad enough. But then came 1948, started losing to Jews. Whoa, I mean, you know, it's one thing to lose to a Christian. To lose to a Jew, I mean, with 300 million Muslims at the time, and, you know, it was, what, 600,000 Jews in, in, in what was known as Palestine at the time? How, how exactly did the Arab armies lose that? And then 48, 1956, 1967, 1973. Arab Muslim armies kept losing and losing and losing. Moreover, as globalization was beginning and uh, more and more commerce and, 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 and uh, global communications were emerging over time, Muslims throughout the Middle East began realizing, ah, uh, the West seems really rich. We seem really poor, unless, you know, we have, except for our oil, but generally speaking, you know, the Nobel Prize winners are not in the Muslim world. The prizes in literature and science and technology and Weren't we the ones, the dominant force on the planet, architecturally, engineering, you know, medicine, literature, the arts? And that was really true. It, it, Islam was a flourishing culture for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and was the dominant force in all those areas. Not in the 20th century. And, and Muslims began to sense this and realize this and began to talk amongst themselves. Uh, and they, and the, the phrase that they often the question that they asked was captured in uh, Professor Bernard Lewis's book, uh, Lewis being uh, maybe the preeminent uh, Middle Eastern historian in the United States, teaches at Princeton University. He wrote a book called, What Went Wrong? That was the question Muslims were asking. If Allah is with us, if our religion is right and just and pure, what is happening that we keep losing? What ha what's happening that we have such enormous poverty, uh, illiteracy, uh, drug and alcohol abuse? Uh, we're not teaching our children. We're not gaining scientifically. We, the, the West and now the East are triumphing us and blowing by us. Lewis wrote about that struggle within the Muslim society uh, in, in a book that came out a few days before 9-11. 2001. And I pick up the theme of, of that book and, and, and talk about it and analyze an updated version of it in Inside the Revolution. It's a fascinating journey to, 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 to see what has happened and why Muslims are starting to ask this question, not just a few intellectuals. I mean, this is the question throughout the Muslim world. And there are three major responses is what I argue in Inside the Revolution. The radicals, the reformers, and the revivalists. And they're all answering the question, what went wrong? Now, the radicals would tell you, Islam is the answer, and violent jihad is the way. 
In other words, their, their assessment is the reason things are going badly is because we've turned our back on Allah. Allah is punishing us because who was running the show uh, in our countries in, in, in the 20th century? Secular Arab nationalists. In Saddam Hussein's Ba'athist party, Iraq. This, is a, this was a secular nationalist movement. Uh, in Gamon Abdel Nasser's uh, regime in Egypt that, uh, that, that led through the, the 1967 war, 70, uh, not 73, but 67 and, and, and prior wars with Israel, this was a secular nationalist movement. Yes, it was Muslim, but it wasn't driven by Islam. It was driven by the, the sense of throughout the 20th century of nationalism, that we, are, uh, that we are, as people, we have the right to run our own countries but we don't really need God to do it. This is just sort of part of the, the spirit of the age is, that, is to have our own countries and not have the imperialist powers of the West or these trying to, to run our lives. And, and that ethos dominated in the Arab world in particular in the 20th century. And the, and, and the argument began to be made by, by Muslim clerics. Uh, you think specifically of a man named Hassan al-Banna in Egypt, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood movement in the early 1920s. Uh, you think of Syed uh, Kutab, uh, an Egyptian writer uh, in the 1960s and uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, you think of um, uh, people, well, actually, it started in the 40s. He came to the United States. Uh, he was revolted by what he saw here, and he went back and he said, we can defeat the West. We can defeat the Americans because they're all they're dancing and they're drinking and they're watching movies, and God is not with them. But God is not with us either because... Uh, we have sided with the West, and we, have, we, we are not following a true, pure, unadulterated version of Islam, and we need to get back to this. And this began to be Khomeini's view. Uh, Albana and Qutab were Sunnis. Uh, Khomeini, obviously, it was a Shia Muslim. But this sense that Islam is the answer to the problems that we're facing, and, and the only way to get back to the glory that was once the Islamic empire is to go with violent jihad, to force people, Jews, Christians, atheists, but also fellow Muslims who don't believe deeply and purely, we need to kill them or convert them and get them out of the way so we can get back to the glory that was once ours. And this is the radical view. And I take the first section of the book to, to break that down and, and look at it from many different angles, including a chapter I wrote called, What is the Theology of the Radicals? What do they believe verse by verse and chapter by chapter? When they go through the Quran, what do they point to to say, that's our motivation for violent jihad? And of course, uh, you know, not only did Khomeini become so successful in taking over what he described as a, a, a secular uh, uh, pro-Western and therefore infidel regime in the Shah in Iran in 1979, uh, but he wanted to export the Islamic revolution, the jihadist revolution uh, all over the world and said so clearly as I uh, quote him uh, directly in the book. And bin Laden picked up on this theme and thought, sometimes you need something different from a state actor. Sometimes you need a, a non-state actor. You, we need to build a, a terrorist network that can move uh, fluidly uh, uh, in states, out of states, get state support when we can, but not be dependent on any of these infidel regimes. We need to overthrow these regimes, drive out the Westerners, particularly Israel and the United States. And that gets picked up right to the present with the supreme leader of Iran, the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and his uh, hand-chosen president of Iran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Uh, these are two men who continue in this, this, this theory that Islam is the answer, jihad is the way. Now, I would love to spend a lot of time breaking down the radicals for you. I, I want, but but I, I want to focus just briefly on the reformers and get into the revivalists to, to provide balance, okay? But let me note that in John chapter 16, Jesus uh, says something very interesting, and I think it's relevant to the moment that we live in today. 
Not surprisingly, right? Jesus had a way. Uh, being this personification of truth, he had a way of uh, helping us understand our own times as well as what is coming and what is past. Jesus told his disciples in John 16, an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. Let me say that again. An hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. Now he says this in the context of Jews and synagogues. The first part of that verse is they will make you outcast from the synagogue, but an hour is coming. Jesus was saying several things. First, he was speaking specifically at that moment that, that once he died and rose again and, and gave the Holy Spirit to the church and the church was planted in Jerusalem and began to move through Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, there would be a backlash. There would be a counter strike against the growing church. And people would think they were doing, when they killed followers of Jesus Christ, they were doing a, an offering, a service to God. This is certainly what uh, the rabbi Saul believed, right? He believed he was doing a service to God. Now, Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and made it clear that that was not a service to God. That was an affront, an abomination to God. And Jesus, classically being the God of the second chances, turned Saul around, and Saul became the Apostle Paul and took the gospel, but knew that he fit right in that verse. He once thought that killing, torturing, imprisoning followers of Jesus Christ was an offering, a service to God, but it wasn't. But he knew that there would be others who would feel the same way and that he and those he led to Christ and discipled would, would encounter the same thing. So Jesus is speaking certainly specifically about the, the, the early stages of the church, but it's a principle that carries all the way through to the current day. Muslims, devout, radical Muslims, believe they're offering service to God when they kill Jews and Christians. But just like the Apostle Paul, Jesus loves them though they hate him. When, while we were enemies of the cross, Christ died for us, right? So, so we need to keep that in the context of understanding God's love for Muslims, as he loved Jews. Just because we don't know God, just because we oppose the Son of God, doesn't mean he doesn't love us. But we, as followers of Jesus Christ, who do love the Lord Jesus Christ and, and want to follow him, need to be engaged in reaching those who think they're doing a, a service for God, uh, but are lost, they're trapped, they're held captive in a satanic ideology, and they need to be set free. Only Christ can set them free. We can't do that. But we can show the love of Jesus Christ, and we can share the love of Jesus Christ, and we need to, even with radicals. One might argue particularly with radicals. Now, uh, one other thought about the radicals for a moment. The, uh, the Gallup organization did this enormous survey. Uh, many years, multiple dozens of uh, Muslim majority countries or, or countries that had a high uh, uh, number of Muslims. Uh, the Gallup organization did this massive global sur survey and they published a book called What a Billion Muslims Think. And based on enormous data and research, they concluded that 7% of Muslims worldwide would either be self-described radicals or sympathetic to the radical movement. And therefore, uh, Gallup said, look, of, the, of all Muslims in the world, about 7% would be defined as radicals, meaning uh, they believe in jihad. They may not all be willing to strap suicide bomber vests on themselves or their children, but they'd be sympathetic. And certainly that's the pool out of which radicals are recruiting. Now that tells us, and as you go through more detail, and I, and I analyze that uh, book and survey in, in Inside the Revolution, but as you do that, you find the good news is that when people say, look, Israel, Islam is mostly a peaceful religion, well, that's accurate in the sense that 93% of Muslims worldwide don't want to kill us, don't want to lead jihad, support jihad, uh, they're, they're moderate in their views. Now, personally, I believe that the more devout you become when you study the Quran, you, you would inevitably be led to radicalism. 
But I'm glad <laughs> that most Muslims aren't studying the Quran. I'm glad that most Muslims say, no, that I, I would totally reject that concept of uh, jihad, and, and I believe that it's uh, a, a, um, a moderate, peaceful book. I, obviously, I, as a follower of Jesus Christ and a believer that the Bible is the only inspired and inerrant word of God and it's an original text, obviously I don't believe that the Quran is from God. Let me just be clear in case anyone had any questions. But when I look at the reformers, the reformers are, are, are saying the radicals are reading the text wrong, the Quran wrong. Uh, there's a different interpretation. In fact, the reformers would say, and do say, and have told me directly, Islam is the answer, but jihad is not the way. Violence is not the way. We need more freedom. We need more openness with the West and with the East. We need to protect human rights, civil rights. We even need varying degrees of democracy. And I describe for the second section in this book uh, the, the leaders of the reformer movement. And, they, and I have a chapter called uh, The Theology of the Reformers. What do they believe, verse by verse, chapter by chapter? Because they look at the same set of texts and, and they come out with completely different answers. Now, we could argue all day about which one is right, but I think it's important to note that there are different sectors within Islam. 7% or so, uh, uh, certainly less than 10, well, I shouldn't say certainly, but that's the, the Gallup and some other organizations' assessment. So maybe one in, you know, one in 12, one in 11, one in 10 Muslims who believe in jihad and radicalism, and, and, and most who do not. Now, how, should we, just as a public policy matter, provoke 1.3 billion Muslims into saying, you're all jihadists, you're all hell-bent on destroying us? This is, would only inflame the situation, and it's not true. It may be theologically true from the Quran, uh, when you study the Quran, but not but most Muslims don't interpret the Quran that way, and that's just an important note. And in fact, many of you that may have Muslim friends, it's generally unlikely that they are jihadists, that they are radicals. And, and so it's important to make those distinctions in our mind. Just as you wouldn't, you know, just as you met a Jewish person, you know, some might be atheists, and some might be ultra-Orthodox, and there's all kinds of, you know, uh, there's a spectrum in between just like a Christian. Some are uh, very devout and faithful to the Word of God and the, the, the teachings of Jesus Christ. Others, you know, it's Easter, Christmas, you know, whatever. Let's rent the next R-rated movie that comes out of Blockbuster. I mean, so there's a range, and we need to understand and appreciate and factor into our thinking about ministry this range within Islam. Now, there are radicals, there are reformers, there are also what I call revivalists. And these are people who once were Muslims, and they have left Islam. And they would say, Islam is not the answer. Jihad is not the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father in heaven except through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Furthermore, the revivalists would tell you that the only way for their part of the world to move forward and make progress in any way, shape, or form as, as societies is to skip back in their history before Islam and revive what they once had. First century, New Testament, biblical Christianity, right? This is where, this is, you know, the, the followers of Jesus founded what we know as Christian, Christianity, Christendom, in the epicenter, right? I mean, this is, this is where it all began. And it's amazing to meet people who are coming out of Islam and saying, you know what, I, I analyze the poverty and the violence and the illiteracy and the drug abuse and, the, and they're looking at the ills within their society and they're thinking, I've, I, you know, I've lived in the Muslim world. I, I, I grew up as a Muslim. And I can tell you categorically, they would say, Islam is not the answer. And violence certainly is not the way. And they have been searching. And the revivalists have found Jesus Christ. Now, when I go back, let's go back for a moment to the rank and file. The vast majority of Muslims aren't trying to lead game-changing movements. The radicals are trying to build a caliphate on earth, right? They want to destroy Jews, Christians, infidels of all kinds, and establish a global empire. 
in which you convert or die, convert to Islam or die. And of course, Khamenei and Ahmadinejad uh, from their Shia uh, Twelver cult within uh, the Shia world, they believe that the Islamic Messiah, known as the Imam al-Mahdi, or the hidden Imam, or the twelfth Imam, is coming soon. And that the way to hasten the coming, the arrival of the twelfth Imam, is to annihilate two countries, Israel, which they call the little Satan, the epicenter of Judaism, and the United States, which they call the great Satan, which they perceive as the epicenter of Christendom. So you begin to understand uh, the, the, the trajectory of their theology, Islam is the answer, jihad is the way, and then their, their tweak on that theologically is that the end of days is at hand, the twelfth Imam is coming, and therefore we need to get on with the business of destroying Judaism and Christianity in order for the caliphate, the global empire of Islam, in their view, Shia Twelver Islam, to take over. This novel that I'm uh, coming out with next month, or this month actually, uh, uh, 16 days from today, The Twelfth Imam, is a fictionalized version of, what, obviously, uh, what would happen if the world waits too long and Iran does get nuclear weapons? And what would happen if this Twelfth Imam comes to Earth? What would Iran do? What would the United States do? What would Israel do? What would followers of Jesus Christ do? I can't tell you that the twelfth Imam is coming because there's nowhere in the text of the Bible that indicates, you know, an Islamic Messiah is coming. But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, when he's giving the list of signs, he says three times to expect false messiahs in the last days. In fact, the first time, the first sign that he mentions in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 and 5, he says, see to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Messiah, and will mislead many. Not might mislead many, not possibly. Jesus said false messiahs will come and they will mislead many. Then in verse 12, I'm sorry, 11, he says, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Then in verse 23, he says, Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe him. For false messiahs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I've told you in advance. So if they say to you, Hey, look, he's in the wilderness. Don't go out there. Or, look, he's in the inner rooms. Do not believe them. For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. I believe, based on the scriptures, and particularly 1 Thessalonians 4, that when Jesus comes, it will be like a, a, a flash of lightning, in a blink of an eye, in, 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 a, in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment of time, we will be caught up in the air to meet Jesus in the air. And Jesus says, if somebody tells you, that the Messiah is here and you should go find him, don't believe him. Because if you truly are a born-again follower of Jesus Christ and you're not in the air, it's not me. <laughs> now, now, that's not conclusive proof that the twelfth Imam is coming, but he could. Jesus is warning us that false messiahs will come. And Believe me, if the 12th Imam were to, you know, show his head uh, in the Arabian Peninsula or in Iran or in Iraq, where he's, you know, written to be uh, coming, uh, he will be one of the false prophets, uh, false messiahs of all time. So given Jesus' warning that we should be prepared for things like this, this is what this novel later this month, the 12th Imam, imagines. What if? How would that play out? And it's the first of a, a series because I couldn't, there's a lot to think about and I couldn't get it all with all the assassinations and explosions and a little bit of a love story woven in there. I couldn't get it all into <laughs> one book. Plus, it's such a fascinating concept to me that it, 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 you know, I couldn't contain it into one. So, 
But, but so, so, you, so you see the radicals and they are rising. The reformers are making progress, certainly in Iraq, for example, uh, in Jordan, uh, to a degree in Morocco. Turkey was the original reformer country, though as I mentioned uh, last night, it is moving now dramatically in the wrong direction. But this brings us back to uh, this issue of the revivalists. And uh, I'm going to speak a little bit more about this uh, as our topic tonight as we talk about finding peace in a troubled world. Uh, I want to pick up on this discussion of who are these revivalists. Uh, we're going to meet a revivalist tonight. I hope that uh, uh, you will in fact be staying for the whole conference because our dear friend and brother in the Lord Jesus Christ, Tas Sada, will be sharing his testimony. Now Tas is a revivalist. He was once a radical Muslim who believed Islam was the answer and jihad was the way, and now he doesn't, which is why he's here, <laughs> uh, which is why I'm his friend, um, at, or more, maybe more importantly why he's my friend. Um, and I want you to meet him, and I want you to hear his story. On uh, tomorrow morning uh, here at uh, Moody Church, I'll also be speaking uh, on, on the big untold story in the Middle East, and, and I'll be giving even more uh, stories and anecdotes and testimonies of people who have left Islam and become followers of Jesus Christ. It's important for lots of reasons, uh, but I just want to wrap up with a couple of examples in this morning's uh, uh, message because, uh, it, because it's so intriguing. We hear so much in the uh, media about these radicals, less so about the reformers, but we hear almost nothing in the media about the dr dramatic dynamic that Muslims are leaving Islam and coming to Christ. Now again, just, just for context, th this vast uh, rank and file, they're watching the radicals. They're watching the reformers. They're watching the revivals, and they're saying, Which, who, who's right? And, and what's happening in, now that uh, uh, satellite television technology has permeated uh, the Middle East. You, you almost can't go to any place in the Middle East without seeing satellite dishes everywhere. Uh, you know, in Iran, it's actually illegal to own a satellite dish. That's why everyone has one. <laughs> uh, Lynn and the boys and I were uh, traveling through the Sinai Desert uh, going to the traditional site of Mount Sinai uh, a number of years ago when I was writing my book Epicenter. And it, it, you take a bus from Sharm el Sheikh uh, on the Red Sea coastline, and, and it's a several hour journey into the interior of the Sinai uh, Peninsula uh, to get to this traditional site. Now, there's some debate about whether that's really the one, but the point is, you're, you're, you know, you're driving and driving, and the kids are classically saying, Are we there yet? I need to go to the bathroom. You know, it's like, oh, it just takes forever. And you, it's like being on the face of the moon for a long time. I mean, there's nothing out there until they say, uh, you know, the driver will say, oh, by the way, there's a little Bedouin community here coming up on the right. And you drive by, and there's like two tents and a satellite dish. <laughs> and, and, and in Egypt, when we lived in, in, in Heliopolis, a, a suburb of Cairo, I mean, every, I mean, the most poor, the poverty stricken uh, communities, uh, huge tenement buildings with just, you know, it'd be people who have just no money, but the, and these dilapidated tenement buildings, every balcony had a satellite dish. I mean, just hundreds of thousands of them or wherever your eye could see. Why? Because the, the Muslim world is, has been so insulated, so cut off from the rest of the world, and is so starved for information and entertainment and sadly pornography and all kinds of and uh, you know better sports scores and more uh, you know uh, they, they were not better ones but I mean uh, uh, better more you know accurate news and they want to understand what the outside world is doing because they feel trapped so they so they'll spend all the money they have to buy satellite dishes because they want to tune into the rest of the world but what's happening is they're clicking through their station and they're like oh, state run news state run news okay cnn don't want to watch that okay uh, you know and, and they're watching you know soccer and then you know and then they're suddenly what, wait wait go back to that go back to that somebody was talking about jesus and 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 there's about a dozen to 15 depends on the country you're in uh, christian satellite networks that are beaming the gospel in produced by Arabs and Iranians and others from the region, people who've left Islam and become followers of Jesus Christ. And what's interesting, Muslims of all stripes are watching the world, and it's, it's feeding this 
this, this feeling of what, what, what is going wrong? Why does the, re the rest of the world have freedom and stuff and we have what we have, which is not that much, and we have tyranny and poverty and uh, illiteracy and so forth and violence. They, the world of the Islamic world is watching jihad and say, we are the true Islam, and therefore they see, people see the jihadists killing Muslims. And many Muslims in the rank and file are saying, if that's true Islam, I can't be part of that. That's not me. Now, they don't necessarily know where to go with that, but that's the stirring. That's the, 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 what's, that's the angst that's going on in the Muslim world. So then when they click through and they hear Father Zechariah, for example. Father Zechariah Boutros is an Egyptian uh, uh, priest. He's, he's a born-again Christian from the Coptic church. Uh, there's a revival, an exciting revival going on in the Coptic church uh, in Egypt. But what, what's interesting about him is he was preaching the gospel, winning Muslims to Jesus in the 1980s, he was imprisoned by the Egyptian government, and they said, uh, and they were, he was imprisoned for life because it's a serious offense uh, to uh, lead Muslims to Christ in Egypt, as it is in many countries. And some countries, it's punishable by death. In Egypt, uh, he was imprisoned for life. But they finally said, listen, we'll let you out as long as you leave Egypt and promise never to return. He said, okay then. So he went to a secure, undisclosed location. I can't tell you where, but he invited me several years ago to come and, actually two years ago, to come and meet with him and to interview him and to see what he's doing. He is preaching the gospel. He's, first of all, he's deconstructing Islam. Uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. He's deconstructing the life of Muhammad. And then he preaches the gospel clearly. He answers people's questions live on his uh, Friday morning uh, program. And then his program is re-aired throughout the week on a network called Al Hayat. Uh, he is, it's estimated that 50 million Muslims a week watch his program. He's, he's sort of the Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity of the revivalists. <laughs> What I mean by that is he's very provocative. He's in your face. He's funny. He's smart. He's got his facts, but he is in people's face that Islam, and in fact, when I interviewed him for this Inside the Revolution documentary film, I, I hope you have a chance to watch it. You'll see the clip where he says, Islam is not the answer. Jihad is not the way. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. <laughs> and no one comes to the Father except through him. I mean, but. He will grab you by the throat and pull you in and then gently, lovingly tell you the truth. Well, people are, you know, they, they're flipping their saying, what did that guy just say? Turn back to that. And we've been told that, and have met people where they say, you know, sometimes people are so poor that not everyone can get the satellite dish. So the richest person or, you know, relative will, will, will buy, in the, in the tenement building, will buy one and then everyone will be hooked up to it. The problem is when, you know, dad who owns it is going, no, everybody's going, wait, 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 uh, 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 no, uh, uh, come on. And then he lands on Father Zechariah. And now everyone in the building is watching, Islam is not the answer. Jihad is not the way. I happened to meet and uh, interview another uh, uh, brother. That he's, so, so, Boutros is reaching the, the Arab Muslim world and 50 million people. There's a bounty on his head estimated at, tw uh, I think it's uh, 60 million dollars. The U.S. bounty on bin Laden's head, 20 million dollars. So just get a context there. Now, in the Shia Muslim world, the Iranian Muslim world, there's a brother named Hormoz Shariat. I met him a few years ago. I call him the Billy Graham of Iran, uh, because he's preaching the gospel. Now, you have to understand, uh, and I was just with this, uh, this brother Hormoz uh, earlier this week, uh, catching up with him and was spending some time with Arab, or, I'm sorry, Iranian Christian leaders. But one of the things that's great about Hormoz, and I write about him in the book, interview him for the film, but he, in 1979, he and his radical Muslim wife uh, were on the streets of Tehran with millions of other Iranians shouting, death to America. Then after a while they thought, mm, maybe not death to America quite yet. We'd like to go to graduate school over there. <laughs> so they applied for school. They got in. They applied for a visa. Of course, our State Department let them into the country. You know, one day you're going, death to America. Then you're like, uh, I'd like to go to uh, Southern California and um, study. So they got there, but their marriage started breaking up. 
They went through weather shock and culture shock and food shock and all kinds of other shocks. And they, were, they had a date certain they were going to get divorced. But then some young uh, Christian women from a local church uh, got to know and befriend Hormoz's wife and invited her to church. And through that relationship, she became a follower of Jesus Christ. Hormoz was like, you got to be kidding me. We are, we are Shia Muslims. We, Islam is the answer, uh, or we thought it was. I, we, but he was really mad. But then he thought, she does seem nicer. <laughs> so this caused him to begin to explore and study the Bible and the Quran. And as he studied both, he realized the differences. And then he realized that the Bible was true, that Jesus Christ was the answer. And now he's preaching the gospel via satellite television. Uh, it's estimated that several million, some, some would say seven to nine million Muslims every Friday night are watching him. He broadcasts from San Jose, California. He uh, does this in the morning, but it airs uh, primetime television in Iran. And because he is, it's so different from everything else on, he's got quite a listenership. This is what's happening. The radicals, the reformers, and the revivalists. I'll tell some more stories now, uh, uh, not now, but uh, tonight and tomorrow morning of, of some of the specific people that I have had the joy and honor of meeting who've left Islam and become followers of Jesus Christ. But as we tie that all together, I, I want to say uh, that I, I encourage you, uh, when you think about this entire topic of in, going inside the Middle East crisis, to think in fo with four words, and I'm not going to go into detail about them because uh, I think they're self-explanatory. Learn, pray, give, and go. Learn what God is doing in the region and what the enemy is doing. And I try to provide resources. There are many other resources that are very helpful, uh, both for Jews and for Muslims. God loves both, and he's reaching both, and it's quite extraordinary. But you need, we need to learn what God is doing and what the enemy is trying to do. We need to pray faithfully, knowledgeably, consistently for the unbelievers in the region, for the believers in the region, uh, and obviously for peace. Give. Give to ministries that are making a difference. Uh, the Chosen People, uh, the Joshua Fund, uh, other ministries that are, that, are, that are doing effective work. Uh, well, you, you evaluate how effective it is, but, uh, uh, but you are beginning to hear our hearts and what we're doing and why. And I'll share a little bit more from the Joshua Fund perspective uh, tonight. And finally, go. If you haven't had an opportunity to go into the region and meet believers and learn and pray uh, and, and to give to the work there, I would encourage you to find a trip going to Israel or to a Muslim country and pray about going uh, with one of us. Um, th this is an extraordinary moment. And there are these three revolutionary forces clashing. Jesus is going to win, but not without our help, meaning he has called us to strengthen our brothers. Not to, yes, Jesus is moving powerfully. Yes, dreams and visions, as we'll talk about more, uh, are happening, and people are coming to Christ, and pre people are preaching the gospel, and people are receiving Christ. Our job is to strengthen our brothers and sisters to stand with them, to, to understand that they even exist, and see how can we help even from Chicago, even from the uh, United States or Canada. May God bless you as you continue to go through this process of understanding what's happening in the revolution. God bless you. Thank you.